Now, we finish up our series called Meaningless. And if this is your first time here, you're kind of checking out the church, we have been walking through this book called Ecclesiastes, written by a, a king in the Old Testament about 3,000 years ago. His name was Solomon. Solomon was the son of King David. And maybe you know about David, David and Goliath. This was his son, Solomon. Solomon was born into wealth, took that wealth, turned it into an enormous amount of wealth, and explored all that life had to offer. He essentially treated life like a science experiment. I'm going to try this, see what happens. I'm going to try this and see what happens. I'm going to go there. And so he explores all of the facets and areas of life. And he comes to the end and is like, eh, it just, it just is rather pointless. It's rather meaningless. Like all of these things that I've pursued, whether it's friendships or money, or I've examined politics, I've examined the seasons of life, it all is rather meaningless. He goes, but with God, he brings the meaning into that meaningless life. He brings purpose into what feels pointless in life. And so if you're new here or you want to catch up, let me just really kind of wrap our whole series up into this one little sentence, and it's simply this, is that God turns meaningless into meaningful. God turns meaningless into meaningful. And so whatever your life is made up of, friends or school or vacations or games you go to or meetings you attend or places you shop, all of the things in life that over time can feel meaningless, if God is at the center of it, he takes those meaningless things and turns them into meaningful things. So regardless of where you come from, regardless of your likes or dislikes, God at the center, meaningless into meaningful. Now, two weeks ago, I was in Hartsfield, Jackson Airport, about to, to fly out. It was with some buddies of mine. We were walking through in the terminal, waiting to, to catch our flight. And my buddy looks at me and he says this. And what he says, you have all said or at least thought, I'm confident if you've ever been to an airport or a public venue. He said this. He said, you know, the airport is a very interesting place to people watch. Okay, you do the same thing. And uh, I go, well, yeah, it is. He goes, man, just, you know, people. And I people watch, and I'm confident that you do. And we all ask the same question of these people that we watch. Why would you do that? <laughs> well, why do you say that? Why do you, like, why? It's just, because in your mind, it's weird. Because in your mind, what you do is normal. And what everybody else does is weird. And so, just FYI, they think the same things about you. Like, they're looking at you going, why would you do that? Why would you act that way? Why would you say that way? If you go to an airport, I mean, you see all these different types of people walking through different backgrounds and all of these things, different likes and interests, the way they respond in public versus that not, all of these things. And the cool thing about the human race is that you can take all of this, put God at the center of a person's life, and the things that are meaningless become meaningful. And this is what Solomon is writing about in this book called Ecclesiastes. And today we're going to finish it up, the last couple of chapters, as he concludes this really beautifully well-written piece on the, the exploration of life. And he's writing at the end, and he's talking about this idea of celebrating and remembering and rejoicing in the meaningful things of life to see the things in life that are meaningful and to rejoice in them and to celebrate them and to remember the one, to remember God who takes the meaningless and turns it into meaningful. Because I think Solomon knew 3,000 years ago what we all know today is that it's easy just to go on to the next thing of life and to forget. And so he tells us, do not forget the good things of life. Celebrate them. Remember the God who gave them to you. Now, I just want to start this off by a show of hands. How many of you, you're like me, you are my people. Now, just be honest. How many of you in your lifetime, you have forgotten or failed to celebrate a birthday, anniversary, special holiday? Just by a show of hands. Whoa, keep them up, keep them up. Okay, y'all are worse than 930, okay? <laughs> y'all, okay, 930, so y'all okay, are my people. Cool, all right. So, I've, I've forgotten more special occasions than I care to, you know, tell you, but I did forget my best friend's birthday two months ago. And I even called him on his birthday and talked to him for 30 minutes. 
A buddy name is Joe. We've been best friends for like 15 years. He lives back in Texas. We talk about every other week, just catch up on life. Um, his birthday was in July. I called him like on a random Tuesday like I normally do. And we chatted for like 30 minutes about life, kids, all that kind of stuff. And being the good buddy, he did not drop hints like, hey, today's my birthday. He didn't say that. We just talked. We hung out the phone. I roll, roll in uh, the house that evening, tell Brianna about my day. I was like, hey, I got to talk to Jay today. And she goes, oh, that's great. It's his birthday. <laughs> what? She goes, yeah, it's his birthday today. So I called him up. It went right to voicemail, surprisingly. <laughs> and just said, hey, this is your worst friend. Uh, happy birthday. So I forgot birthdays. I forgot Christmas one year. <laughs> You've never done that before? <laughs> oh. Forgot Christmas. I shared this before, but I woke up Christmas morning, forgot that to buy Brianna a Christmas gift. I have a lot of things on my mind, all right? So I was, I was like, oh, it's Christmas. So I wrote her a check from our joint checking account. <laughs> it, it was not a Merry Christmas for me. So <laughs> you, you laugh and juggle, but th those things are meaningful. Birthdays, anniversaries, holidays. And it's important that you and I Remember those things and celebrate those things and rejoice in those things. And this is what Solomon is. He's concluding this letter called Ecclesiastes, this, this book called Ecclesiastes. He's going, do not forget your creator and rejoice in the life that he gave you. If you got a Bible, grab it, go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. We're going to pick it up in verse 7. If you don't have a Bible, they're going to put it up on the screen for you. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, start in verse 7. Here's what he's writing. Light is sweet. How pleasant to see a new day dawning. When people live to be very old, let them rejoice in every day of life. But let them also remember there will be many dark days. Everything still to come is meaningless. Young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in. But remember that you must give an account to God for everything you do. So refuse to worry and keep your body healthy. But remember that youth with a whole life before you is meaningless. And so this first part, he's talking about rejoicing in life. Young and old covers the, the, the full age spectrum. Young and old, rejoice. Rejoice in the life you have. Rejoice in every minute, every day. And he goes, yes, there's going to be bad days to come. Yes, there's a flip side of that coin. But first and foremost, he goes, to rejoice in the life that you have. And he continues on, chapter 12. Chapter 12, verse 1, he, he continues on. He goes, don't let the excitement of your youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say, life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light of the sun and the moon and the stars is dim your old eyes and the rain clouds continually darken the sky. So now he, he shifts gears to remembering your creator. Now verses three through five, Solomon gives a very graphic description of the physical body getting old. I realize that there are kids here in this room. So to help you avoid an awkward conversation at lunch, we're going to jump to verse 6. <laughs> Some of you want to know what verse 3 through 5 says, don't you? And go read your Bible. All right, verse 6. Yes, remember your creator now while you are young before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Don't wait until the water jar is smashed at the spring and the pulley is broken at the well. For then the dust will return to the earth and the spirit will return to God who gave it. So he covers these two big ideas, rejoicing and remembering, rejoicing and remembering. And I, I'll just phrase it for you this way. It says to rejoice in the life that you have and remember the one who gave it to you. Rejoice in the life you have. He goes both young and old, rejoice in your life. Enjoy every minute of it. And he goes both young and old, Remember your creator, remember the one who gave it to you. Rejoice in the life you have, remember the one who gave it to you. Let's just, I want to talk about those two big ideas for, for just a second when it comes to your life. And I want you to go back and I want you to look at verse 9, chapter 11, verse 9. He says, young people, it's wonderful to be young. Enjoy every minute of it. Do everything you want to do. Take it all in, but remember that you must give an account to God for everything that you do. 
So to both young and old, his first and foremost, he goes, to rejoice in the life that you have. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, the Apostle Paul would say this, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Because I think Solomon and the Apostle Paul knew what we all know today. And that life will give you plenty of opportunities to cry, to be angry, to hurt, to feel pain, and to complain about all the things in life. Life will give you many opportunities like that. But what Solomon is saying and what Paul is saying to, to us today is those things are going to happen, but first and foremost, to rejoice in the life that you have. God has given you a life. Wealthy, poor, famous, not famous. Solomon goes, you have a light that's been given to you by the creator of the heavens and the earth. He goes, rejoice in those meaningful moments. When God takes the meaningless, the, 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 the meaninglessness of your life and turns it to meaningful, when he takes things that feel pointless and gives them purpose, he goes to rejoice in that. Paul says it grows your faith when you do that. It takes no leadership or self-discipline to complain. Complaining is super easy and doesn't accomplish a whole lot. Nobody gets inspired because they complained. Oh, man, I, man, I, I admire them. Why? Because they complain about everything. <laughs> what? Oh, man, they are the best complainers I've ever met. Any ailment, any issue, any concern, they are the first to complain about, and it's inspiring. No, it's irritating. He goes, rejoice. Yeah, life is going to throw you some bad things. It's not going to go the way you want. If you're a perfectionist, you just got to realize life isn't perfect. It's never going to be hitting on all eight cylinders all the time, every day for the rest of your life. There are going to be some issues. But the, the things in your life, look and find ways to rejoice. Now, I'm just going to be honest with you, and, and I think you're my people, so I'm just going to lay this out there. I don't know why this is, and I could be alone in this, but now for like the next eight or 10 weeks, when, when football season is back in, life feels better to me, okay? Now, this could just be me, but two, three. Like, I love Saturday morning college game day, and I love it when the temperature's gonna drop like another 20 degrees, and I like wearing a sweatshirt, and I love watching college game day and to see all the things, but you'll see this if ever you watch it, they always run these human interest stories. You know, these little three to five minute stories, uh, and it's usually people associated with a certain team, and a lot of times it's little boys or little girls that are going through like difficult things in life. They're going through some tragedy, they got some terminal illness, and they, and they tell this story about this little boy, this little girl. And the thing that's most inspiring about these little boys, little girls, that makes this story like tug at your heartstrings is to see these little boys or girls go through these tragedies in life and you see the joy and the happiness in their life. You see the optimistic outlook in their life. It's what makes this three to five minute story amazing because they're going through some difficult things, but you just see their joy and their outlook in life. And then see these little boys and girls inspiring and making grown football players cry. They're crying because they see this little boy or girl going through a tragedy, a devastating thing, and to see them celebrating, rejoicing, to see the joy in their life. Complaining is not inspiring. Rejoicing is. What Solomon is saying is to rejoice in the life that you have. Young or old, look for those moments to celebrate. When God takes meaning less, turns it into meaningful, celebrate, rejoice, even if it's, even if it's not exactly what you had hoped for, even in your perfectionist mind, it's not exactly what I wanted for, celebrate and rejoice in the things that God's done for you. A couple of weeks ago, ago I get a text from Brianna. And she goes, David, who's my second born, she goes, got 100 on his geography test. Now, my oldest, Daniel, his view on school and experience with school is the same as Brianna's. It just comes easy to him. Like, it's one of those kids where he just makes straight A's, doesn't study that much, and it's just kind of easy. That was Brianna's view and experience with school. David takes after his dad. Now, when it came to letter grades, personally, I like to experience the entire letters of the alphabet. 
want to be a well-routed kid. What does a C feel like? Let me try that out. I'm, I just kind of did that. So, you know, David views school the way I view it. it it's a necessary evil that you got to do to get to the really fun things in life. And so when she texts me and goes, David got 100, like my mind was blown. I was like, David, our second born, the fourth grader, he got that and she goes, you know, and I was like, oh my goodness. We called parents and grandparents, David got 100, David got 100. It was a big deal and he was, congratulations. And then the next day, she goes, so where's the, the test? And he goes, oh, we haven't gotten the test back yet. <laughs> How do you know you got 100? Well, I just felt really good when I took the test. <laughs> <laughs> because I filled in all the blanks. I was like, man, I appreciate the kid's optimism. Like, <laughs> kudos for you, dude. It's okay. So a couple of days later, we got the, he didn't, didn't exactly get 100. He felt good about it, uh, but he got an 85. And we're going, an 85? Like, I was blown away. I was like, that's the, one of the best grades I would ever receive on geography test. So we celebrated. We called parents and grandparents, and David got an 85, and he's like, oh, my goodness. I mean, like he won the Super Bowl, and we celebrated. Why? Because, man, it was a moment. That, man, yeah, we thought it was 100. It came in 85. We're still going to celebrate that moment. I think for many of you, you want life to be 100, and it comes in at an 85, and you're frustrated with the 15-point delta. I want my marriage to be 100, but it's an 85. I want my finances to be at 100, but it comes in at an 85. I want my career to be at 100, but it comes in at an 85. And instead of looking at the 85 and going, man, God has blessed this, we look at the 15 and going, why can't I have that? A meaningful 85 is better than a meaningless 100. A meaningful 85 in an area of life that God is blessing is so much better, so much more fulfilling than a meaningless 100 of perfection, whatever you think. So what Solomon is saying. It's going to rejoice in the life that you have. Wherever you're at going, God has given it to me. He's at the center of my life, taking meaningless, turning it to meaningful. So I'm going to look for ways to rejoice. Then I want you to go and I want you to look at chapter 12, verse 6. So he talks about rejoicing, and then he talks about remembering. I want you to look at verse 6. He says, yes, remember your creator now while you are young, before the silver cord of life snaps and the golden bowl is broken. Well, what he's saying is remember your creator now. Not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not next time you get a raise, not next time your kids do something great, not next time you go on a date with her. Now to remember your creator now. And if you're like me and you're wired like you're a type A driven personality, this is a difficult thing to apply in your life. I'm a, I'm a guy going, man, thank you, Jesus. Appreciate you delivering, but I'm on to the next thing. I'm on to the next opportunity. I'm on to the next issue. I got to tackle the next problem I got to solve. And it, and it takes self-discipline going, no, remember your creator now. Not next week, not next year, not next time it comes around. But now look back going, oh, God is faithful. God does heal. God does restore. God does answer prayer. Because to remember your creator now before it is too late. And it's almost like Solomon was writing in the year 2019. Remember him now before another thing is put on your schedule. Remember him now before another thing takes your energy. Remember him now before another thing takes up that valuable space in your brain. Remember him now. Because I think for many of us, it's easy to forget to remember. It's easy to forget to remember the creator, the one who holds all things and takes meaning less and makes it meaningful. And what's interesting choice about that word, remember, you really look at what, in the word that he used and remember, it means to remember, but with the intent to obey. So it's not just remember and think about, oh, that's great. It's to remember with the intent to obey. It's to go back and go, oh, he's been faithful, so I'm going to continue to follow him. Oh, he's healed before, he's delivered before, so I'm going to continue to walk in faith and obedience to him but to remember him now before it is too late because it is so easy to forget to remember. And you get out of the habit. You get out of remembering all that God has done and on to the next thing. That's why Solomon's going, no, 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 no. Rejoice in the life you have, but do not forget the one who gave it to you. 
Last week, again, back to school with David. David's doing some math homework, fourth grade math homework with Brianna, of course. And um, they're at the table, and Brianna goes, hey, I need you to help David with something. I got to go do something else. And, and I go, what are we doing? She goes, we're doing subtraction. I was like, okay, awesome. I got this. And it's, she goes, where well, you got to, uh, to borrow, carry, Bar- carry, borrow, borrow. You know where you take one over? You don't even know either. All right, so <laughs> it's fourth grade math. She goes, well, you can borrow it. And I was like, oh, yeah, I got this. So, you know, it's like 898 minus, you know, 104 or whatever, something like that. So I'm up there and I'm showing David. It's like, oh, yeah, you just cross this out and you put it over here. And he goes, why? I don't know. It's what you do. I, I don't need this. <laughs> borrow it. Just move it over. Just all you got. I'm not that hard. Just, so I started doing all this math and figured it out, and I got the answer. Now, I'm a full-grown man. And I did the math, and David's watching me, and I go, here's the answer. And you're going, something's not right. You ever had that feeling? Like, I'm, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Like, I've never, you know, thought that, but I'm going, I don't think this is right, but maybe, maybe it is. And so I was like, there it is. Circle the answer. And Brianna's there, and she goes, seriously? I was like, and I was like, oh, I was off by like a whole hundred. Like I completely forgot to borrow one. I stole it instead of borrowing it, apparently. Whatever. I don't know what I did. And David looks at me, and he, he kind of like that, that look of shame, but also a little pride in him. And he looks at Brianna, and he goes, yeah, I think Dad just uses a calculator all the time. And I was like, yes, and I do. It's been like 30 years, son, since I tried to figure this out. It's been a minute since I remembered how to do this. And I think it's easy for that to happen in our life with, with God and the things in his life. Man, he's delivered, he's responded, he's restored things, and it's been a minute. It's been a year, it's been two years, it's been three years, it's been five years. Oh, I know I need to get back in church. Oh, I need to, no, I need to stop and remember the things of God, but I'm on to the next thing. That's why he goes, remember your creator now. Today, right now, not tomorrow, not next week, but now. When the creator of the universe, who spoke things into existence, the creator of the sun and the moon and the stars, when he takes your life that lacks meaning and lacks purpose. And in his sovereignty, instills purpose and meaning into your life. Your friendships, your money, the seasons you're going through, those things. How arrogant of us to stop and to fail and to remember and to thank the creator of the universe who's done that on our behalf. There is a God of the universe and it's not you. There is a God of the universe, and it's not me. The God of the universe who spoke all things into existence takes meaning less, turns it into meaning full, and we go, eh, Uh, yeah, I know, but I just, you know, I'm going on to the next thing. That's why Solomon's going, no, 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 no. I'm the king of the land. I've got more money, more power, more opportunities, more fame. I've got more than anybody else on earth, and I'm here to tell you, Remember the one who gave it to you. So if God has blessed, if God is taking the meaningless, pointless things in your life and giving them purpose and meaning, stop and remember the one who did. So here's where the rubber meets the road on all this. Here's what you do this week with all this. Simply find reasons to rejoice and find ways to remember. Find reasons to rejoice and find ways to remember. So this week, starting this afternoon here at lunch, just say, Lord, for the next seven days, Lord, open my eyes. Lord, let me find reasons to rejoice in my life. I'm not not hitting at 100, but man, I'm at an 85. I'm at a 75. I'm somewhere in there. But God, it is a meaningful 75. It's a blessed 85. And so God, let me find a reason to rejoice in that. And Lord, help me find ways to remember. It's sunrises and sunsets. It's looking up at the stars at night. It's watching your kids learn to walk or your grandkids learn to walk. It's good food. It's, it's, it's fresh air. It's blue skies. It's sunshine. It's looking at the lake, at the ocean. It's stopping going, God, let remember that you're the creator of the universe. And you take my life, the things in my life that are meaning less, and you make them meaningful. And so I stop and remember. Find reasons to rejoice and find ways to remember. And the, the reasons to rejoice can be super tiny and super small. It's just those little moments. 
those little things. It's really what do you set your eyes on, the, the things of God and the blessings of God or the frustrating things of life? I'll give you just an example that Brianna and I do. So we have four kids and we call them our four plates because we feel like we're constantly spinning them. And they go from age 12 then to age four. And so we're constantly spinning and making, we're responsible for their mental, physical, spiritual well-being, their education, you know, all of these things in life. And as a parent, you've been there, you're constantly spinning plates. And this plate may begin to wobble, and so you begin to spin that one again. And then there's someone, you run over here and spin this one. And so it's just a constant, you know, as a parent. But every now and then, every now and then when we put the kids to bed and all four kids are in bed and Brianna are there in, in our bed about to go to bed, we just replay the day, conversations we've had, things we had. And every now and then we begin to think about our four kids just in that period, that, that 24-hour period. And you go, you know what? Today, all four plates spun correctly. Now, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. One may begin to wobble, one may crash, but we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But today, Jesus, thank you for all of our plates spinning. Their attitudes were good. They're doing great at school. They're healthy and all these things. So, Lord, we praise you for today. We rejoice in today. Tomorrow may be different, but today we're going to bed. All four plates spun correctly. I don't know what it is for you. It's easy to complain. It takes no leadership or skill to complain, but to rejoice to grow your faith, to look at the good things of God, to see the meaning less turn to meaning full because of God's sovereignty in your life, that is something to rejoice about. Find reasons to rejoice and find ways to remember. And then Solomon concludes, it's interesting. He concludes the last two verses. Out of 12 chapters that he's written in his book, Ecclesiastes, he wraps everything up. As the king who has treated life like a science experiment, he goes, here is what I have concluded about life. Verse 13, that's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion. Fear God and obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. The king's final conclusion of life. After all is said and done, after every area that he's explored, he goes, hey, 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 here it is. Fear God and obey his commands. Fear God and obey his commands. And that fear of God is a reverence of God. Reverence and obedience. To understand that there is a God of the universe, that he loves you, that he cares for you to reverence him, and then to walk in obedience to him. Going, there is a plan, there is a purpose, and there is a highest and best use for your life. And there is a way to find meaning and purpose in things that feel, that feel lack of purpose and without meaning. And the only way to do it is to walk in obedience to God. I read a quote this week by Oswald Chambers. He wrote a book, the one most everyone knows, called My Utmost for His Highest, and he writes this. He says, the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. When you fear God, you fear nothing else. When you're, when you're reverent to God, when you're humble to God, when God is at the top of your world, he goes, you have nothing else to fear. But if you don't fear God, then everything else is a big deal. And worry and anxiety and fear come on you in a second. Fear God, you fear nothing else. Don't fear God, you fear everything else. I'm going to finish with this, and it's what the prophet Isaiah said out of Isaiah 53. And Isaiah writes, and he prophesies about the Messiah coming, Jesus. Solomon, when he wrote Ecclesiastes, was written before Jesus walked the earth. But he writes Ecclesiastes as going, hey, fear God. Have a relationship with God. Make God the center of your life. A rich relationship with God. That is what makes things meaningful. Isaiah prophesies about this Messiah to come. And you and I here today in 2019 know that Messiah was Jesus, God on earth. And you want a rich, deep, meaningful relationship with God. You want to walk in reverence and fear of God. It starts 
with a relationship with his son, Jesus. And Isaiah prophesies about this Messiah. And when you understand your relationship with Jesus, then you understand why you and I have every reason in the world to rejoice and to remember all that God has done for us. Isaiah 53, verse 3. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with deepest grief. We turned our backs on him and he looked the other way. He turned our backs on him and looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. It was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment for his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be made whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us, like sheep, have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. The reason Jesus was beaten and crucified and hung on a tree to die was because of your sins and mine. Those things in the darkest parts of your mind that nobody really knows about those shameful things. All of our sin and all of our shame was placed upon Jesus on the cross. And he took our shame and he took our sin, was buried, came back to life, defeated sin, shame, guilt, and death once and for all. And the good news about Jesus Christ is that if you would place your faith in him, you literally walk out of this room a new person. And that's not preacher rhetoric. That's not some, let me make you feel good about yourself. That is a truth of life. That God so much loved you and he so much loved me. And he wants a relationship with you and he wants a relationship with me. He goes, I'm gonna make it very, very simple that if you would place your faith in my son Jesus, what happened on the cross, you would receive forgiveness for your sins, salvation for your soul, and spend eternity in heaven with your heavenly Father. You may have heard preachers talk about this thing called the gospel. It literally means good news. The reason why is because that is good news. This is why we rejoice. This is why we remember because the love of God was displayed through his son, Jesus Christ, on the cross. This is what Isaiah writes about. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray, but all of our sins were laid upon him. The greatest display of love the world has ever known was shown by Jesus on that cross. And the truth is, if you'd place your faith in him, your life would be forever changed. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I get it that probably most of you in this room, you would say that at some point you've trusted Jesus. He is your Lord. He is your Savior. But man, I would just simply ask, you know, do you rejoice in the life that you have or do you tend to complain and grumble? Do you remember the creator of the universe who gave that life to you? Do you stop and are you rejoice and are grateful for all that he's done? Or do you just constantly move on to the next thing? And if it's been a minute, then I would just write where you're sitting to say, today, Jesus, I rejoice in my life that I have. It's not a 100, but it's a meaningful 85, and I'm grateful for it. And today, I remember you, the God of the universe who's spoken to an existence that has turned my life from meaningless into meaningful. And while you're there praying, if you're here in this room or you're watching online and you've never trusted Jesus, There's never been a moment in your life where you're going, Jesus is my Savior and my Lord. Then my guess is, you may never tell me this or somebody that invited you, but deep in the back spaces of your heart and of your mind, there is some guilt and some shame and some 
and things you're not proud of. And you can be made a new person. Your life can move from meaningless to meaningful if you'd place your faith in Jesus. What happened on the cross, the fact that he died, buried, came back to life. If you'd place your faith in Jesus Christ, God's son, I promise you, you will walk out of this place a new person. Sins forgiven, salvation secure. You'll spend eternity in heaven when you pass from this life to the next. If you're ready for that to happen, I cannot encourage you enough to make that decision today. If you're ready for that to happen, say something like this, mean it from the depths of your heart. Just say, today, Jesus, I trust you. I ask your forgiveness for all my sins. Jesus, I place my faith in you for the salvation of my soul. I believe you died on the cross, were buried and came back to life. And I'm placing my faith in you for the salvation of my heart. Fill me with your spirit. Teach me from your word and help me to live for you, Jesus, for the rest of my life. Father, I pray for all of us. I pray for those in this room or online that said that prayer for the very first time. I pray that they would rejoice in their salvation. Lord, I pray for those of us that are Christians, God, that we would stop running 100 miles an hour and today we would remember and we would rejoice in the life you've given us. We ask these things in your name. Amen. We're going to close our time today by celebrating communion. You can open up that little top part and pull out the little wafer. And on the night before he was crucified, Jesus gathered his disciples around to celebrate Passover and he takes out the bread and breaks it and he goes, this is my body broken for you. Every time you do this, remember me. They wouldn't really know what he's talking about and then hours later, they would see Jesus' body broken. And so from that moment on for the past 2,000 years, Christians all over the world gather to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made. And so right now we are going to remember that sacrifice. The little way for you holding your hand represents the body of Jesus that was broken. Today we take it to remember him. And then the little cup of juice, as you carefully open it up, On that same night before he was crucified, he takes the cup of wine and he goes, this is my blood that is poured out for you. And again, they wouldn't fully grasp it until hours later, see his blood shed for the entire world. And for 2000 years after that, believers all over the world have been celebrating communion and the cup representing the blood of Jesus Christ. And so today this little cup of juice in front of us as simple as it is, represents the blood of Jesus that was shed for you and for me. And so today we take it to remember him. I've asked Sean to close out our service with a song called Man of Sorrows. It's an older song, but it's taken out of Isaiah 53, the verses that we read at the end. And I just want you to focus on the words of what he's about to sing. And then halfway through, he'll tell us to stand up to sing it. But let this song be a moment for you to rejoice in the life that you have and to remember the one who gave it to you.